Old Testament scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 1 through 3a, and then 14 through 15. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Sechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all of the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the lands of Cana and made his offsprings many. I gave him Isaac. Verse 14. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestor, ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Our text for today is from Luke's Gospel. We read from chapter 18, beginning with verse 18. A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, the man said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, there is a story of a man who knew at the age of three what it was that he wanted to do. He was naturally gifted for this work, and he also worked very hard to develop those natural gifts. When the time came, he was fortunate enough to land his dream job with an organization that was located right in the town where he had grown up. This man loved what he did, and he was very good at it. But it was his work ethic that impressed people, even people who didn't know how good this man was at what he did. In his line of work, it was very physically and mentally demanding, and no one did what this man was able to do, and perhaps might not come close to being able to do it again, even in that line of work. And that was to step up to the plate every time that his name was called. Man's name is Cal Ripken Jr. and he is the great shortstop for the Baltimore Orioles. And he played in every game of every season for 16 straight years. When he broke the consecutive game uh, play record in 1995, millions of people tuned in to watch him not to watch him pitch a no-hitter or to hit a grand slam, but merely for stepping up the plate, for showing up for work that day. There was another man who we read about in our text for today. This man had every advantage. 
He had wealth. He had intellect. He had a position of authority. He was perhaps a, a ruler of a local synagogue council, perhaps even on the Sanhedrin. He had, as we can tell from the respect that he had for the teaching of rabbis, even a rabble-rousing rabbi like Jesus, that with the piety that he demonstrates reveals that he had the best religious training that could be had. But for all of this man's sincere desire to learn from Jesus how to be more obedient to God, this man was not willing to step up to the plate and do what Jesus asked of him. Where Cal Ripken never wavered in his love for the sport of baseball, the rich ruler was of a divided heart when it came to his faith. Where Ripken played through injuries and continued to make adjustments to his game so that he would continue to excel, didn't have to, he had a contract that assured him great wealth. The rich ruler loved his money too much to make the sacrifice. Ripken was held up by the Orioles management as an example of this is what you get when you come to every infield practice throughout the year, you get an invitation to the All-Star game. Jesus held up the rich ruler as an example of how not to miss the invitation to eternal life. Two men two different approaches to playing the game. One, just following the rules. The other, playing the game with heart. Playing the game with love and desire. And so we read in verse 18, a certain ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus has been on his way to Jerusalem. He is instructing and teaching the disciples. As we know, the disciples were not learning. They were sometimes dense to what Jesus had to say. And other people watching also wanted to learn from Jesus. And the rich man was there, and he approaches Jesus, and he says, I would like to know, too, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This man wasn't pressing Jesus or challenging him in the way the Pharisees tended to do. This man genuinely wanted to know, wanted to have a closer relationship with God, looking for meaning. And Jesus responds. He says, well, you know the commandments. Jesus begins to recite the commandments, telling the man, you need to follow the law. And we can imagine the man being somewhat perplexed and confused because he knows that he's been following the law. And so he says to Jesus, well, all these I have kept, all of these commandments I have kept, meaning, of course, that he'd been following the letter of the law carefully his entire life. What he hadn't been doing was playing the game with heart, with love, with desire. And, and we know from our own experience as parents, when we take children to uh, become involved in sports, some of them do just what they're told to do. They learn the rules, they walk up, they try to hit the ball, but you can tell that there's really no desire to excel or to improve. Other kids, they want to get better. They've got what coaches call hustle or heart. They've got a genuine desire to, to be great, and they continue to improve, and, and that's the kind of difference that Jesus was talking about here. 
calling us not to be just people who play the game the right way or play by the rules, but radical discipleship to follow after him and to follow the law with love and desire. And we can hear it in the difference of the way that Jesus instructs his disciples to love one another. Law requires that we love one another. And so to follow the law, we love one another. And yet, what does Jesus instruct his disciples to do? He says, love one another as I have loved you. He escalates the law to that point of hustle and heart. He says, that's what I'm calling my disciples to do and to be that kind of, of radical discipleship. Now, Jesus knew that the rich man had too much love for his money in his heart. He knew that there wasn't enough room in the man's heart for the kind of dedication and devotion and love that it would take to be his disciple. And so he tells the man, he says, when Jesus heard the man say, I've been following the law my whole life, Jesus says, well, you still lack one thing. You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come back and follow me. Jesus says, you have too much of love for money in your heart. So make room. Make room in your heart for the kind of love that it will take for you to be my disciple, to, to live the law the way that, that I am calling you to live it. Make room in your heart by letting go of the thing that it is full of. So you can make room in my heart in your heart for the kind of love that I expect from my disciples. Now, it wasn't that Jesus wanted to separate the man from his money. Jesus wasn't some kind of first century Robin Hood who was twisting arms to try and accomplish some kind of a redistribution of the wealth. What Jesus wanted to separate the man from was his love of his money. He wanted to help him make room, just like the children have to make room in their lives by setting aside the boxing gloves if they want to play golf. Make room in your hearts because we are so anxious to hang on to the things that we think we love, the things that we think that we need, the things that are the desires of our heart. We hang on to those things so tight that we don't have empty hands ready to receive the true treasure, the riches of heaven, eternal life that Jesus is ready to, to gift us with. If only we have the hands open to receive. We need to set down, set aside the things that we cling to in our hearts, make room for the real prize. And, and Jesus is, is something like a, the talent scout here who pulls the parents aside or the, the child who wants to succeed at a sport and says, kid, I can make you great, but you're going to have to sacrifice in order to achieve that dream. You're going to have to make some hard decisions about whether or not you want to devote yourself wholly to the playing of this sport, or you're going to want to have friends that you party with, and after school jobs, and all of the other things that are distractions. Jesus telling us, 
if you want to follow after me, if you want to be a disciple, in the way that I am calling disciples to be, then you're going to have to give up some things. You're going to have to make that decision to devote yourself wholly without a divided heart, undivided heart for Jesus. The rich ruler was not willing to make that sacrifice. He wasn't willing to step up to the plate. Verse 23, when the man heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. He weighed the decision and he was saddened by the reality that he wasn't willing to make the sacrifice. We all struggle in the way that the rich man struggled. Money and the things that it, it represents and it could provide for us in our society is so desirable. We don't talk about it. We don't like to hear preachers preach on it. Preachers don't necessarily like preaching on these kind of texts because we all struggle with this love for money, with this thing that fills our heart up instead of what we should be focusing on in following after Jesus. I have struggled with this in my life. I grew up without a lot of money. We were dependent on uh, public assistance, food stamps, and free lunches. Um, I wore clothes that I got from the basement of the Methodist Church. There was a dumpster diving and a brief period of homelessness. I thought it was all kind of rather bohemian at the time, but, but I was a person when I decided what I wanted to do with my life, went to law school, not because I wanted to be a do-gooder or to um, provide some benefit for the world, because I wanted a job that I thought would provide me with the kind of security and safety that I desired. I had tremendous love for money in my heart. I was Scarlett O'Hara going off to law school, seeing where she rises up from the field, she clenches her fist and she says, so help me God, I will never be poor again. And when God came to me and said, would you like to leave your employment as a lawyer and come work for me? I said, no thanks. <laughs> I said, no, thank you. And here I am today, still struggling with that dependence on God instead of my dependence, I think, on my own ability to provide that kind of stability and security in my life. We all struggle with it. I am grateful because of that for the model of those of you who are more mature spiritually in your discipline. Jesus calls us to a variety of disciplines as disciples. To prayer calls us to worship, calls us to Bible study, calls us to service calls us also to give. In our giving, I am grateful to those of you who are the Cal Ripkins of this congregation. The people who, whether you have two mites like the widow, or you have the ability to tithe and more, who come faithfully every week and make an offering of yourselves and of your resources, giving back to God what God has entrusted to you. Those of you who, from a variety of, of, of perspectives and abilities with different resources, some of you able to, to hit a grounder to get on first base, some of you who are able to bump offer up a sacrifice fly. Some of you who are just timid even to get up there and hold the bat, but demonstrate the most faith of all because you do it. 
and even the people who are able to get a home run and, and provide vast donations that can allow us to build a sanctuary when God calls us to do it. We don't say thank you for that kind of, of demonstration of our spiritual giftedness. It's easy for us to applaud beautiful music as a demonstration of our giftedness. And, and we commission people to go on mission teams and, and we call teachers and hopefully thank them at the beginning of the year and the end of the year for serving in the church. But we rarely take the time to say thank you for those who demonstrate their spiritual maturity through their giving as well. And so we pause today as we thank God for having given us the resources to, to be all that he calls us to be and do as his disciples here in this place, to be this family of faith, to be the body of Christ here, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of a broken, and sinful world who so desperately needs to hear the message of his good news. I say thank you, God, for giving us the opportunity to give back a portion of that so that as we have been blessed, we can be a blessing to others. Thank you.